Hey, fellow babies. Welcome back to Pactor Factor on Sifted.net. Um, we have to be pretty honest here, pretty brutally honest. Sifted.net doesn't have enough subscribers to stay afloat. So we're going to probably have to wind down operations, wind down the Pactor Factor. Um, as I've said many times, I don't get paid for this. I do it for free, but it still costs money for Shane to produce this content and get it posted on the Internet. So if you enjoy the Pactor Factor and you'd like to see it keep going, it would be great if you could find $4 a month to subscribe to Sifted.net. You get lots and lots and lots of other content. You get curation. It's actually a pretty slick service for 4 bucks. What the hell? And actually, you probably should give up those lattes at Starbucks anyway. So you can afford it. It's worth it. Um, I took about a year and a half hiatus when Game Trailers got sold and we lost Pack Attack. I probably am going to take a permanent hiatus if we stop doing Packer Factor. So if you enjoy it, would really appreciate it if you can spare the four bucks. Join Sifted.net. Uh, just go to the site. Pretty easy to join. So our first question comes from Twitter from at Annoyed Gamer. And the question is, do you miss me? And my question back is, who are you? No, it's actually my friend Marcus Beer, Ice Cold Beer on Twitter. Um, yes, Marcus, I miss you dearly. And uh, if we can get enough people to join Sifted that uh, Shane can actually keep this going until you know we, could, we get you out of your Altadena home and drag you over to Long Beach, uh, maybe the three couples, Shane and his wife, you and your wife, me and my wife, could go to dinner. And uh, on the way to dinner, we'll do a cruise and we'll film an edition with you and me riffing on whatever's wrong with the world and there's plenty wrong so yes marcus i miss you deeply you are my good friend i don't see you often enough love you thank you for asking a question moving on to questions that might be more interesting to the rest of you uh from the sifted site from drunken elvis wow drunken elvis you know, elvis died god 40 years ago right yeah was he drunk when he died nah he was probably on drugs he died 40 years ago. I don't even know what month, but it was, it was 1977. Wow. Do you? Th and by the way, he was born in 1935, so he would have been 82. Go figure. He's older than John McCain. That's I mean, that's pretty old, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you think E3 has a future in L.A.? Gee, I sure hope so, because I live in L.A. Um, for that matter, does E3, as we know it, have a future? Better question. And where do you think would be the next best place to host a new and improved E3? Um, to be honest with you, I'm going to take those in opposite order. I actually think E3 would be better in Vegas. And the reason I say that is Las Vegas has sufficient hotels in a very concentrated area to host something as big as E3. Las Vegas has enough convention center space to actually have an EA Play in one place, a Fan Fest for, for E3 in another, E3 Coliseum in another, and the E3 show floor in another. So I actually think Vegas would work better. Um, Vegas is pretty easy to get to, even for international travelers, just because a lot of people come there to gamble. Um, and it's actually really cheap, and they're equipped, as I said, with hotels and food and everything else. And I think it's fun. So I, I think that you know, when you get dragged out on Saturday to an EA Play press conference, there's actually a lot to do the rest of the day, which in my case would be play craps. Um, so, you know, I think people would whine a little less about a week's worth of E3 if it was there. So that would be the next best place. Um, I believe that the ESA has signed a multi-year contract with the convention center, so I think we've got another three or four or five years anyway there. Um, so back to the first question, do you think E3 has a future in LA? I think that's where it's going to be. Um, it, it's relatively inexpensive for a lot of developers to get there because we have a pretty large concentration of people between San Francisco and LA. Um, so it's a pretty easy, short trip. Uh, you know, the Blizzard guys have to drive all the way up from Irvine, you know, 40 miles. I mean, just not crazy far. Um, Activision's in Santa Monica, EA's in San Francisco. So I think. That makes these Microsoft and Sony, both West Coast companies, so pretty easy to get there. Um, so I think that works. And then, uh, does E3 as we know it have a future? You know, um, I think you had Electronic Arts kind of throw down the gauntlet and challenge E3 
by saying that they felt that a fan focused show made more sense. So EA, you know, pulled out of E3. They're not on the show floor. They're doing their own thing. Uh, a year ago, they did it really immediately next door. Um, this year, they did it a, a handful of miles away, four or five miles away in Hollywood. Um, and I think E3 doesn't want that to happen. The ESA doesn't want that to happen. So they responded by opening up E3 to fans. It's going to evolve. So E3 as we know it, you know, a year ago there were no fans at E3 and we had EA Play competing across the street. This past year you had EA Play competing four miles away and E3 open to fans. I didn't particularly care for the fan, you know, uh, congestion. Um, I personally believe they can tweak this. I think they could open up Kentia Hall, which if you know the convention center is kind of underground. It's underneath the main hall. Um, it used to have all the indie cool games down there in a pretty big open space. And I mean, I, I have a vivid memory of Red Octane showing off Guitar Hero in 2005, I believe, and going down there. And I, because I know the guys who run Red Octane, I went down to say hi to them. And there had to be a line 250 people deep to play Guitar Hero the first year it came out. And I was like, whoa, this is a real thing. That's where I think you should have EA Play and or the Fan Festival. I think you could probably have limited, you know, opportunity for fans to play games down there all day and open up the show floor at 3 o'clock or something so that, that the business can get done between 10 and 3, let the fans be there from 3 to 6 or 3 to 8 or whatever time the, you know, the ESA wants to host it. Then at least we wouldn't be as congested because, again, one of the things I liked about E3 is when they started actually requiring real credentials a few years ago and they cut the show down to probably 20 or 30,000 people. It got manageable. I remember back in 05, you could not make a cell phone call from the show floor. It was so freaking loud. And I remember, you know, three or four years ago, it's great in there. You can absolutely hear, you can talk to people. So I think that it's going to continue to evolve. Um, I respect the ESA for, you know, for acknowledging Electronic Arts concerns and trying to come up with something that is workable for all the companies that attend. Uh, I do think letting fans in is a good idea. I just think you have to manage the flow so that the business people can get their stuff done as well. Um, so, you know, it's going to morph. And so the answer to your question is probably stays in LA. Probably not E3 as we know it. Probably morphs. Okay, our next question from Twitter from at Stefan McDoofy. Great name. What is Nintendo doing with online? Why is it still so far behind the times and why does it not seem to matter? I think it's because they're insular and because they're Japanese. And I don't mean this like Japanese people aren't smart enough or good enough or technologically competent. It's not, you know, Japan is not the, the cradle of online innovation. I mean, that's Silicon Valley. And I think if Nintendo were open to it and they were more like Sony, which is a Japanese company, they would hire people who understand online networks and multiplayer and they would focus on it and they haven't done that. So, you know, they're just now getting to where you can find a match for Mario Kart 8 without having to enter, I don't even know what it is, 25 digit code, you know, some crazy gamer code. Um, it's hard. And setting up stupid little things like voice chat that we should take for granted is a pain in the butt. Now, in fairness to Nintendo, they don't have very many games that really lend themselves to multiplayer. So I think Splatoon does. Um, I think Mario Kart does. But most Nintendo games, you know, Smash Brothers, I guess, is one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so it's, 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 com it's competitive multiplayer, but that's two players. Most of their games are single player. You know, so they have a handful of multiplayer, couple player games. Mario Kart, you can have however many cars you can have on screen, six or eight or whatever. Um, Splatoon, I don't even know what I guess you could arguably do four on four or 16 on 16. But, five on five, that game yeah, it's like, I'm, I haven't played it yet. So the point is, I don't think Nintendo puts a lot of thought into multiplayer and you know, looking at things like voice chat on Splatoon, 
it's convoluted. It's complicated. I don't know why. I mean, I mean, the easy answer is headphone jack on the docking station, and you have voice chat. I'm not sure why they didn't build that in. It doesn't seem to me like that's that hard. I mean, the hardware component there is probably literally 50 cents. The software is what takes your voice and puts it over the internet through internet protocol and allows other people to hear you talking. And that's not hard to do. I mean, you're listening to this video, that's what's going on. I mean, that's what Twitch streaming does. It, it's pretty simple. So again, I'm not a technologist. I just know that there's off-the-shelf solutions and they don't seem like they're interested in buying them. Um, so back to, you know, the Japanese. I think that they really do think they know better. I think that they put somebody in charge who's not particularly good at this and nobody there is willing to acknowledge that they don't know what they're doing. So the answer is it's Nintendo and you just have to accept that they're going to do things their own way even if they're wrong. If you want to get it fixed, I think you just have to complain loudly and often and eventually they'll probably figure out a way to fix it because it really is just a software patch. Okay. Oh, and then why doesn't it seem to matter? Because they're Nintendo and you guys love them no matter what they do. I mean, to be fair, they deserve your love for their content. It's phenomenal. And so far, I'd say they deserve your love for the Switch. It really is a great device and it's fun. Um, but, you know, they're just not going to execute everything flawlessly. And it doesn't matter because I think people overlook, you know, some uh, deficiencies when the package is good. Um, that's the case of my wife and me. You know, she loves me. She loves me because I'm such a great, great wage earner, but, you know, I'm kind of ugly and not a particularly nice guy. Okay, our next question from Sifted website from Specter Man. <laughs> Love this word. Why do platform holders turn into dicks when they are in a leadership position? Uh, the leadership position. And I, that, that's a, that's a term I'll have to look up, dick. I have to figure out what that means, but I'll figure it out in a second. For example, Sony won't allow cross-platform cross play with other platforms. Wouldn't being pro-consumer help Sony maintain that leadership position? Nobody turned into a dick. They were already dicks, whether they were in leadership or not. And I have a funny little anecdote. Um, I had a next door neighbor. He's an old guy. I'm, I'm get rapidly approaching his age. But he called the police on us nine times. And it's like no matter what we did, nine o'clock at night, if we had music on outside, police call. And this guy had, uh, he collected crap cars. So he literally had about nine or ten Mercedes that I, I looked them up on Kelly Blue Book. The average value was $2,500. And he had nine or ten of them, and he littered our street with, they completely filled up every parking space. And he would literally hire people to come rotate and move them on street sweeping day, and we hated him. And his name was Dick. And he was a dick. So the good news is, Dick moved. And apparently, when he's selling his house, he was offered more money from somebody else, but he ended up selling it to this other old guy who bought it for his 25-year-old son. And Dick was convinced, and he's going to move in with his two roommates. So Dick was convinced if, if three 25-year-old guys moved in next to me, that was going to piss me off. And so he actually told them that. I love these guys. Two of them came to my E3 party. I love them. They are the nicest guys ever. And I actually help them pick music for their party. So, and they drink scotch. So anyway, um, yeah, I hate anybody who's a dick and especially one named Dick. But the truth is, you know, I agree with you. If Sony would allow cross platform play, I think that would encourage people to, you know, like them more. But they're trying to be differentiated and say, if you want to play Rocket League on the PlayStation, then you're going to have to play with other PlayStation people. And if you really love it, then tell all your friends who have Xboxes to get it on PlayStation. And that's, they believe that that's the selling point. So I, I can't really dispute it because I don't have any kind of data that tells me that cross platform play, you know, helps them sell more PlayStations. Arguably it does not. Um, so I don't know the answer, but I agree with you from a consumer perspective. I'd much rather have it. But from a platform holder perspective, I kind of think they're right, that they'll sell more PlayStations if they limit access 
to games only the PlayStation are. So, again, I don't blame them. I know you called them a dick. I kind of like the Sony guys, so it's hard for me to call them that. They're, they're pretty nice to me. I think they do a good job. I am really happy for them that they are kicking butt this generation, um, and I agree with you. They'd be more likable if they had a lot of cross-platform play. Anyway, don't know the answer, but dicks. My neighbor was a dick. Calling the police on me, dick move. Our last question this week, because we're I've been talking forever, is from the Sifted site from Jay Lynn. Jeremy Lynn? I think? Maybe. I highly doubt it, but... When Facebook first bought Oculus, did you think that that was a good buy? If so, do you still think it's a smart buy? What does the drastic drop for Oculus Rift really mean? You know, I, I have to tell you that um, John Riccatello, who is the CEO of Unity, used to be CEO of Electronic Arts, told me that he invested in Oculus with, at a $200 million valuation. And it was a few weeks, maybe maybe a month or two, two, at two months at most, before Oculus was bought. And, but he told me, you know, yeah, Oculus, I'm joining the board. It's got a 200 million valuation. I'm buying whatever percentage of the company he's bought, he bought. And that sounded reasonable to me. And I know that was the valuation. So I remember, I remember vividly where I was. I was at Caesar's Palace. I was at CinemaCon. I was outside by the pool meeting with the uh, AMC theaters management team. And my phone rang. I actually was sitting at the table next to Jeff Keeley, of all people, for real. And my phone rang, and it was the Wall Street Journal calling to ask me what I thought about Facebook paying $2.4 billion for Oculus. And I said, you have to be reading the press release wrong. You have the decimal point in the wrong place. It's got to be $240 million. It can't be $2.4 billion. And they said, no, I'm reading it very clearly, you know, and of course, five minutes later when I hung up, I looked at my phone and there it was. So uh, what did I, did I think it was a good buy? I thought it was really, really, really expensive. Um, do I think it's a smart buy? I'll be fair. Uh, you didn't ask me this, but I'll give you another little story. I was at this event in Rancho Bernardo and it was the day Facebook bought Instagram, and that was a billion dollars. So I'm gonna answer it in that context. I was like, what's Instagram, right? I, I did some quick research, figured that out. I remember coming home and telling my wife and kids that I was on TV that day, and they were like, what were you on TV for? And I said, oh, Facebook bought Instagram, and that was the first day I found out that my then I think 11 year old kids, maybe 12, were on Instagram. But anyway, I'd never heard of it. Billion dollars, I was like, this is ridiculous. 30 million users, are you kidding me? You know, you're valuing this thing at $300 per user. Instagram now is probably worth 50 billion. It was a brilliant purchase. So the reason I brought that up is, who knows what Oculus is gonna turn into. At the outset, it looks expensive because Oculus didn't actually have a product didn't have any users, didn't have any games. It was all just kind of conceptual. I mean, they had demo kits and we all had seen it and it looks cool, it is really cool. Um, so sure, here we are, you know, a year after launch and oh goodness, they haven't sold 100 million units yet because it's expensive still. So the recent, you know, the recent price drop is telling you Facebook's serious and wants to develop an audience. And Oculus is, you know, what's known in business as a chicken and egg product. You know, which comes first, the hardware or the software? Well, if you make software, you don't want to spend tens of millions of dollars making software if only a million people are in the addressable market. And if you're, you know, going to make hardware, if you're going to buy hardware as a consumer, you're not buying hardware if there's no software for it. So it's a, a real problem. Like you actually need to get both to happen. Oculus, I think, would have had trouble with their own balance sheet being worth 200 million bucks a few months before, paying out giant bonuses to developers for developing, developing Oculus games. Not anymore. So Facebook can do that. Um, I expect you're gonna get a lot of great content in the next year or two or three. I think you're gonna get Facebook essentially giving the units away because I think they want you to do more things in virtual reality. I think there are commercial applications. You can look at real estate. 
their healthcare applications. A doctor could theoretically examine a patient without either one of them leaving their homes. So, you know, there's a lot you can do with that. I mean, you could probably do surgery with Oculus. Um, so I'm, a, I'm actually a big believer, but no, I didn't think it was a good buy. Um, I don't think at the time it was a smart buy, but now I'm beginning to see how Facebook can turn something like Instagram into something that really, really works. Um, so give Facebook some time, because I think they've got a lot of building to do. So with that, fellow babies, I think I've completed a very long episode. Thanks, uh, Annoyed Gamer, for the question. Um, thank you in advance for your Twitter follow, at Michael Pachter, because I really got to get over 44 or 5. I, I've, been, I've been stuck at 44,000 subscribers or sorry, followers on Twitter for like three years. I got to I got to get to 45,000. So please. And if you really refuse to follow me on Twitter, then you must join Sifted. So looking forward to you guys subscribing four bucks a month. Join for a month. Check it out. You don't need that latte anyway. Give it a shot. Uh, Shane needs you. Otherwise, we're going away. Thank you for joining us, fellow babies. We will see you next week. We hope.